watch this full series at the links in the description below and subscribe to our YouTube channel to watch new mental health videos every week. Ketamine was approved by the FDA in the 1970s. While it's been used for decades in hospitals during surgical procedures, ketamine is now being administered for treatment-resistant depression, extreme anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, and chronic pain. Is this safe? And who is the perfect candidate for ketamine treatment? This series will answer those questions and more. Welcome to the Med Circle educational series, Ketamine, an in-depth look at a modern mental health treatment. Wow, what a topic yeah. this is. It's I've been hearing about ketamine for years and years and years, yep. and now in California, we have clinics popping up left and right where people can go in and get treated for depression. What are you seeing? Yeah, and this is so, it's important for people to understand what ketamine even is, and there is a lot of stigma around ketamine as well. And we're gonna see more and more of these clinics pop up. So I want people to be educated as to what is really going on here and also what to look out for if you decide to go to one of these clinics because there are some things that you really need to know before you do this. So before people try ketamine, I, uh, from my understanding, most people first try an SSRI. Yeah. If that's correct, what is an SSRI and what does it do? Yep. So. When people have depression, you know, aside from psychotherapeutic intervention and you know, CBT and all the um, interventions that are non-medication, one of the go-to strategies is the SSRI, right? We talked about Prozac, Paxil, Zoloft. Those are the pretty common medicines that are prescribed for depression. Now, unfortunately, Kyle, only about 47% of people respond to an SSRI, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that leaves a lot of people that don't respond to an SSRI. Now what happens is if someone tries multiple SSRIs or SSNRIs like Cymbalta um, or Pristique or Venlafaxine, these are very similar. But if someone doesn't respond to two or more trials of different medicines in this class, they're considered treatment resistant depression. The medicines aren't helping them. So they're gonna fall into that category of people that just really no matter how many of these medicines you throw at them, it's just not helping, mm -hmm. right? So that leads us into this population of people that need something different, right? And at this point, psychotherapy didn't work, the SSRIs didn't work, so what do we do? Now we go to that second line of treatment, right? And when we look at the SSRIs, I mean, this is fascinating, right? You look at the SSRIs, and SSRIs fall under the theory that the monoamines in the brain, now a monoamine is just a fancy word for dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin. Okay. Three neurotransmitters, right? There are other monoamines, but those are the basic monoamines that we try to change the levels of in the brain to facilitate happiness, mm -hmm. if we can. So when you're taking an SSRI, for the most part, you're dealing with the monoamines, right? Now, in neurology and psychiatry for decades, we've known that there's something very interesting about a different neurotransmitter system. And that neurotransmitter system is called glutamate. Glutamate works, on, works off of a receptor called the NMDA receptor. And that's really just as long as you know that, NMDA receptor. This is a completely different pathway than the way that the SSRIs work. Now what scientists realized in the year 2000 when they actually did studies on this, we're going back 20 years almost, they realized that if you block the NMDA receptor with ketamine, it, you get this incredibly profound antidepressant effect very quickly that was shown to last over the course of days to several weeks, even months in some studies. So, Doctors and scientists and neurologists and researchers are going, wait a second here, we need to look at this because this is different than the pathway that we were going with, with the SSRIs, and this may be something very important to look at for people with treatment-resistant depression. Now, there are other medicines that, that play with the NMDA receptor, but ketamine was approved in the 1970s and has used, is used every day in hospitals. I know people don't realize that because it has a little bit of a bad rap for abuse, but ketamine is an anesthetic, is an analgesic, meaning it's for pain control, anesthesia, and even something, um, a, a dissociative to help people when they're going through surgery. It's used in the ERs all the time. People don't realize that. Sometimes it'll be given for sedation in the ER. In a lot of cases, it's used by your oral surgeon or your dentist. If you need to be put under for a tooth procedure, they'll give you a little bit of ketamine. So ketamine is used and it's been used widely and it's been proven to be very, very safe 
physically. It's a very safe anesthetic. And the reason why it's very safe is because it doesn't suppress your breathing. So anesthesiologists love it. They say, hey, this is a medicine that we can use. It's very safe. So it's used for anesthesia all the time. Now we're realizing as researchers that sub-anesthetic doses, meaning doses that don't put you to sleep, but very minimal doses help tremendously with depression, profound changes in depression. So that's why we're seeing ketamine pop up in ketamine clinics because delivering it intravenously at a very low dose reverses depression, at least temporarily for now. That was a lot. I know, it's a mouthful, I know. So let me clarify this. The SSRIs work on those three, serotonin, dopamine, and the other one. Yep, norepinephrine. Norepinephrine. If those don't work, then we can use ketamine to block MMDA. MMDA, yeah. And that will make you happy maybe for a few days up to a week after that dose. Yeah, and here's, here's the okay. very, very important point is that we're talking about treatment-resistant depression and we're talking about severe depression, mm -hmm. okay? We're talking about suicidal patients. We're talking about patients that have lost their quality of life, right? We've talked about ADLs, activities of daily living. We're talking about people that will not get out of bed, people that will not go to work, people that feel completely hopeless, have tried therapy, have tried SSRIs, have tried SSNRIs, and it's just not working. They feel hopeless. Mm -hmm. So even though this is new and still not FDA approved and experimental, quasi-experimental, it's hope. And my analogy is this, if people are in the midst of a severe storm and nothing is getting them out of that storm, even if you can pull them out of that storm for a week or two, can be beneficial to get their life back on track. But what about this nasal spray? I thought that was FDA approved. Great point. Now, so the nasal spray, we have to make a little bit of a distinction here. The nasal spray was just FDA approved, which is actually really, really exciting in psychiatry because they're realizing the importance of ketamine compounds to battle treatment resistant depression. Now the nasal spray is something called S-ketamine. It's not ketamine per se, it's a molecule that resembles ketamine. It's an enantiomer of, of ketamine. But it's, it's not S ketamine it's es ketamine correct okay. es ketamine and this was a patented form of ketamine that can be uh, used intranasally that has shown some promise and pharmaceutical companies are interested in this because they want an easier method to deliver the ketamine right, right. Um, but it still requires a doctor's supervision to mm -hmm. do it and we can talk about um, how that is administered um, but that is different than the iv infusions of ketamine where that's that's ketamine, the ketamine that was FDA approved for other purposes in the 1970s. And that's not FDA approved for the treatment of depression at this point, but we'll get into that. What will people get out of this series? Well, I think people are gonna start hearing more and more about ketamine. And I think it's incredibly important that education takes place here, that people understand what this is all about, what it's used for, the safety profile, who might benefit from it, and sort of what to look out for in a lot of these clinics that are popping up. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a very, very important education for people with treatment resistant depression to give them options, Yes. right? To know what your options are, you need to know what your options are. And then also just to understand it a little bit more, to go in with a little bit more of an education about how it works, what the side effects are, and what to expect. And you're a double board certified psychiatrist. What is your relationship though with ketamine? How have you personally used it? I am very conservative with medicines, actually. I'm one of the more conservative guys that don't jump to medicines right away. But unfortunately, I see people all the time that have this treatment-resistant depression, as we described, and I want to give them what works. I need to get them out of that hole. So there are patients that I will administer IV ketamine to, and I've seen some really good results anecdotally in my own clinical practice with ketamine. So even though it's not FDA approved and it's quasi-experimental at this time, I'm very, very cautious with it. I'm very selective with the patient base that we use it for, but I have administered it to patients. I'm, I'm familiar with the protocol. I've done it with patients. I still do it with patients that need it. Um, so I'm very experienced with it. And, um, and it's actually shown some pretty good benefit that we can talk about. Fantastic. Well, this series is for anybody who thinks that they or someone they know could benefit from the use of ketamine for serious depression or treatment-resistant depression. So make sure you check it out right here on MedCircle. I'm Kyle Kittleson, and remember, whatever you're going through, you got this.
Thanks for watching. Check out the links below for more information on how to access this full series and subscribe to our YouTube channel to watch new mental health videos every week. Did you like what you heard in this video? If you want to ask a MedCircle doctor a question directly, you can learn how by visiting the links in the description below.